thankful for the grace of God today. Amen, amen. Well, welcome, everyone checking us out online. We're glad you're here, and we're glad you're here in person, of course. And I am just so stoked to start this new series I'm calling Growth in the Gap. How many of y'all know that life is largely lived in the gap? Yeah, the gap, the gap between what was promised in God's word and the product of that promise coming into fruition. There's a gap there. There's a gap between what was spoken over us and the sight, seeing what was spoken. There's a, there's a gap. There's a gap between the revelation and the realization of the revelation. There's this thing called, you guessed it, a gap. Just a few weeks ago, actually about a week and a half ago, we were in Austin for this great growth opportunity uh, with the, uh, my, my lead team here from the church. And we were flying back to, to Phoenix and we had just gotten to the airport three and a half hours early, thanks to Pastor Michael Dan. Thanks a lot, Pastor Michael. Um, he's an executive pastor of operations, so he's very operationally minded. He wanted to make sure we didn't miss the flight. And so we were there. We had three and a half hour gap, a lot of time to kill. So what do we do during that gap? Well, we actually do what most people do in Austin. You listen to live music. And so we were in the airport. We found a restaurant and there, there's a, a solo artist that was up there just singing and, you know, songs that he had written, which was great up until the point at which he started talking about his puppy. I've got nothing against puppies. But this particular puppy, he was speaking of, he was pontificating and going on and on about his puppy and his puppy's got an Instagram page and his puppy's got to go fund me for the love of God. And so he's going on and on about his puppy, so much so that we were distracted. Cindy looks at her watch. Uh, guys, we're late. We jump up. We begin to run to our gate. Well, me, Pastor Michael, and Maeve. Maeve is Pastor Michael and Aaron's daughter. The three of us made it to the gate. My wife and Aaron, they're like, uh, we got to use the restroom. <laughs> My wife has the bladder the size of a goldfish, and so it just is what it is. And so she goes to the restroom, and we get to the gate. The three of us get to the gate, that is. They're in the restroom, and they come on the loudspeaker. Last call for, final boarding call for pa party of Dan and party of Lipinski. If you do not report, your seats will be lost. And so Pastor Michael, he gives me, he, hold Maeve. And he gives, gives me Maeve. I drop my backpack, and I'm holding her. He runs over, tries to tell them that we're there. But I don't want to miss my flight either, so I, I, I begin to like start to shimmy my backpack while holding Maeve. I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop Maeve, but I'm going to, and, and this, this nice onlooker saw the whole thing. And he comes up to me and says, can I help you with, with your guys' daughter? <laughs> I thought, we are in Austin, and Austin's in Texas, but Austin isn't really Texas, Right. And before I could, you know, tell the guy, hey, man, that's not how I roll, I, I didn't have time because I didn't want to miss my flight. And so I'm like, yes, you can help us with our daughter. <laughs> and so the guy grabs my bag. We go over and we get checked in. And, and just when we're ready to board the, uh, the plane, the, the, the girls come back. And so we got the whole party together. But then we got to take the walk of shame. The whole plane is packed. The only seats that are empty are our seats. We held up the whole stinking plane. So 130 people are on this plane just watching us walk in. And, you know, they were scowling at me and, and, and making faces at Michael. But not Aaron. Because this time, Aaron took back Maeve. And she's walking and she's the nursing mother. And they're like, oh, sweetheart, it's okay. We understand. Oh, you're cute little baby. Then... The one who gets the short end of the stick was actually my wife, Cindy, because Aaron, truth be told, the reason we were late, or at least one of the major reasons we were late is because she had to go get herself a Starbucks on the other side of the airport. So she goes and gets her, her Starbucks, and then when she's walking in, she's like, uh, Cindy, could you hold my Starbucks? And she takes me. So Cindy walks in with a Starbucks in hand. Everyone's thinking, oh, you're the one that held us all up because you had to get your Starbucks. It was, a, it, was a, it was a disaster. Here's the picture we took on the plane. We're like, you know, I don't care. We're going to have some fun, and, and everyone hates us. It's, it's all good. 
But I think a lot of us, if we're honest, we can relate to that story of the gap. Because I think a lot of us in our gaps, we tend to get distracted. We tend to, and that distraction can lead to disillusionment. Maybe you've been in the gap so long, you feel like you're experiencing depression. You see, the thing about the gap is, although there'll there'll always be a gap, there'll always be another gap, we were never meant to to live full time in that gap. And sometimes a, a season of our life turns into an actual lifestyle to where we think, you know what, it's just how it is and it's how it's gonna be. Friends, what you and I do in the gap matters. It determines whether you get on that plane and get sent to where God's taken you or whether you get stuck. Are you being sent or are you being stuck? You get to choose. You get to choose. Here's the message that God gave me to to share in the title, and you may not like it, but I'm just going to give it to you straight. You ready? God told me to tell you, get over it and get on with it. Look at your neighbor and say, get over it. Other neighbors say, get on with it. Get over it and get on with it. Now listen, the God, God told me that means two things. There's really two categories of people, and, and he, he broke this down for me. Because I'm just like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm like really black and white. Matter of fact, get over it, get on with it. I got it, God. He's like, no, no, no. That means two different things. I said, what do you mean? Well, for some people, it's cut and dry. You know who I'm talking to. God, God will impress on your spirit. Get over it, get on with it. You're not supposed to be in that season. You've been there too long. Get over it and get on with it. But for some people, the gap that you're in is beyond your control. There's other people. There's other circumstances involved, and you can't dictate that. But here's what God's saying. You can't control that gap, but it doesn't have to control you. So for for, for those people, for that category, for that group of people, God's saying, get over it, meaning... Get over the hurdle. Get over that growth thing in the midst of the gap. The gap ain't going bye-bye. It's going to be there for a little bit. But in the midst of that gap, get over the hurdle. Learn that thing I want you to learn. Experience the growth that I want you to experience. Not that I'm going to take the gap away, but that you can get over it. And in the midst of your gap, get on with it. Amen? Get over it and get on with it. Luke chapter 24, we're going to get God's word today. It's Resurrection Sunday. Whew. Every, all, all, the, all the people that were following Christ, they were devastated. Why were they devastated? Because they thought the Messiah was going to come. Jesus, here he is. He's going to come and he's going to take out all the Roman authorities and he's going to establish his earthly kingdom. Let's go, Jesus. And then whew, Friday happened. The cross happened. The crucifixion. And that wasn't what they thought was going to happen. And now they are rocked. They're devastated because not only Jesus was crucified, but their hope in Jesus was also crucified. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you feel like, you know what, I feel like my hope has been crucified in the midst of my gap season. Maybe you're watching online today and you feel like, man, yeah, my hope's crucified. So these two people, one was named, we know from text, one was named Cleopas, and we believe that the, uh, the other that was traveling from Jerusalem with Cleopas to his home in Emmaus was probably likely his wife because they're going to their home. So probably Cleopas and his wife, they're leaving. It's Resurrection Sunday. They can't believe what's going on. They're heading back on the road to Emmaus to their home. They're talking about like, what's next? Like, what do we do? They're in the midst of a, a, a gap, a hope gap. What are we going to do? Jesus shows up on the scene and he helps them get over it, and get on with it. Luke 24, verse 13. Now that same day, the day of the resurrection, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and they uh, discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. More on that in a second. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, and you can just see the dejection on their face, the disappointment. 
They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem that doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. How many know when Jesus asks a question, he doesn't really need to know the answer? He's just entertaining them and seeing what they're going to say. As, as, uh, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. They, someone, so, so I'm, I'm preaching to someone today. You had hope that Jesus was going to do something, that something was going to turn out differently. You had all your hope, and now it's just crushed, it's dashed. In addition, some of our women are amazed. Uh, uh, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish, this is Jesus talking now, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Why did he disappear? He disappeared because what he had come to do, he did. He accomplished what, how many know that God accomplishes what he sets out to accomplish? He got them over it, and he got them on with their life. And that's what God wants us to do today. He's saying, get over it and get on with it. God, I thank you as we get into your word today that you speak to us mightily, God. We, we're ready. We are ready to receive truth from you today. We need your truth. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How do we get over it and get on with it? I'm, I'm going to give it to you straight. At the risk of offending new people who don't really know how we roll at the gathering, I'm going to give it to you straight. The gap helps us deal with our crap. You want me to sanitize that? Pastor Rod, you want me to break that down and make it a little, a little, a little more user-friendly? So the gap helps us deal with our spiritual weaknesses that can debilitate us if left unchecked. Or we can just say crap. <laughs> last week, last week I, I had um, the Fisher family up here, and I dedicated their, their, their two boys. Bo and, uh, and Granger. Granger's the one on the right. He's three months old. And that wasn't the outfit that he was supposed to be dedicated in. You see, the song preceding the, the child dedication, Granger, whose name means to work, was doing some work, if you know what I mean. He was having a little dedication of his own, a little diaper dedication. Had a little blowout. Yeah, blew out his whole outfit, and they had to change the outfit. That was the backup outfit. And I was, getting, I was thinking about that in, in light of God saying, you know, deal with your crap. I, th I think sometimes God, like, like a proud parent, just like, just like Holly Ann wanted to show her son off, you got him all dressed up in his Sunday best and had all, everything perfect, everything, had, probably had some of that baby lotion on, just smelling good, you know. And, and God's the same way. He gets us all dressed up. He wants to show us off to the world. It's called the church. He wants to show us off, but we messed ourselves. Oh, I know that doesn't apply to you. I must be just talking to like, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm just preaching to myself today. But like God wants, God says, you know what? Deal with your crap. Like deal with our stuff. And I'm, I am preaching to myself, but not just myself. Like deal with what God wants us to deal with. I mean, look at this. They were literally talking crap about Jesus. Verse 21, when he, 
but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem us from Israel. You know what their crap was? Unbelief. Unbelief. And I think some, we struggle with the same crap. We do. Unbelief. <laughs> and it's not like Jesus didn't warn them, y'all. How many times in the New Testament did Jesus tell them what was going to happen before it happened? Here, let, me, let me give you one. Luke 9, verse 22. And Jesus said, the Son of Man, he's, this is, he's telling his disciples, hey guys, the Son of Man um, must suffer these things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day must be raised to life. He tells them what's going to happen. It happens, and then they don't believe it, that it happened. That's unbelief. And God says, deal with that unbelief already. But here's the crazy part of this story. This is the most, one of the most puzzling verses in the Bible, verse 16. But they were kept from recognizing him. Wait, what? Jesus shows up on the scene, and, and the, the student of the Bible's thinking, yeah, he's going to fix things, right? That's what Jesus does. He's going to show up and fix things. And you know what he does? They're kept from recognizing him. What we should be asking at this point is why. Why was he kept? And really, more than why, by whom? Now, the, the, I've heard this preached many times, and most, most people that, that preach this, they say, well, Jesus kept him. Jesus kept him from seeing him. Is that true? Perhaps. We don't really truthfully know. We, can't, we can only infer and deduce, right? We don't really truly know because it's not in the Scripture. But let me offer something more plausible, in, in my opinion, based on Scripture. Now, this is my opinion. You can go to the Holy Spirit and, and uh, seek this for yourself. But if Jesus kept them from recognize, re- re- recognizing him, Why is it that in John 20, that same morning, Mary Magdalene had no problem recognizing Jesus at the tomb? He said her name, Mary, and she's like, Rabbi, she recognized him. Did Jesus all of a sudden morph into a new person? Did he put on a mask in in the next hour before he saw them? Or did somebody else keep them from recognizing Jesus. Friends, I think it was the unbelief of Cleopas and his wife. They themselves kept themselves from recognizing Jesus. Unbelief does funny things to a person. It helps you see things that aren't there and impose your will and your belief system on something that is way beyond our comprehension and capability. Someone's with me today. Girl, you can move up front. We need some amen in this church. I was telling telling my brother, uh, Fred, we were talking this week, we had coffee, and I was telling him, man, I grew up in a black church. I grew up in a black church, and and, and so... Just know that the amen and stuff, like, let, let's be spirit-filled. We, we are with worship. Let's be like that with the message. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And so I think sometimes it's us. It's our fear. It's our doubt. We keep ourselves from the blessings of God. And then you know what we do? Okay, so, it, so check this out. It's our crap that prolongs the gap. God says we can do this the easy way, we can do the hard way, and we're like, ah, you know. And so we don't deal with the crap, and it prolongs the gap. We extend the gap because of us, not God. And then what do we do? We blame it on God. God, why? How could you allow this to happen to me? And we're a bunch of butthurt Christians. And and, and people come, yeah, amen. People come in, people come in to visit churches, and they see a bunch of butthurt Christians, like, if that's what it means to be a follower of Christ, no thanks. I don't want to, I have no interest as your pastor in raising up a, a bunch of entitled, you know, milk-sucking Christians. Like, let's, let's, let's be followers of Christ, and let's deal with our crap. Amen? Amen. 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 And I hope you, I, I hope you hear that in love, because it's coming in love, but, it's, but, you know, my mom used to say, Johnny, true love is a pat on the back, a foot lower. And then she spanked me. <laughs> What she didn't know is I had seven pair of briefs on, no. 
That's actually a true story. I'm not even joking. You can ask my mom because I got spanked so much. But I needed it because it helped me deal with, with stuff I need to deal with. But then we blame God for not fixing what we refuse to address. Stop asking God to fix what you and I refuse to address. There is a sense to which God has given us the ability to dictate the trajectory of our life. And when we choose volitionally to not live in accordance with his will, don't stand in line to whine to God. Now, God can still redeem it. God can still make up for that. But let's, let's just do the right thing as best as we can, knowing that we need grace, because we ain't going to always get it right. We need grace. I need grace. But, man, let's deal with our stuff, man. Let's just deal with it. This week, I had to deal with something. So anybody have a laundry room that's not really a laundry room? You know what I'm saying? Quavam, is your laundry room like that? Don't you say that your wife's sitting right next to you. She's probably a neat freak. She's probably all beautiful. So, but, now this isn't my wife's fault. This is our, my kid's fault. Our laundry room is like a, it's a holding bay for a bunch of junk. Everyone's like, it's like someone put a sign out there and said, dump your crap here. Because it's, and, and I have a picture of it, but I value my marriage and my life <laughs> enough not to show you the picture. But I sent I sent them a picture. I sent my kids, like we have a Team Lipinski uh, group text. And so I sent my whole family, all of us, all six of us are in it. And I sent the picture of, of the laundry room and I said, we're better than this. We're better than this. Oh, yeah, I'm getting over it. I'm getting on with it. I'm dealing with the laundry room, y'all. I'm gonna lose my salvation if I'm not careful. That's a joke. We don't believe you can lose your salvation. At least I don't. But guys, at some point it had to be dealt with. And so, you know what I did? I took all that crap out the laundry room for the next hour, and I put it in the living room. That's it. That's all of it. And that picture, that picture actually minimizes it. There's a, it looks, trust me, in person, that's a lot of stuff. And I put it there so that we would be forced to deal with the crap. And don't you know, now that we've done that, at first they're mad, everyone's mad, all the kids are like, dad, dad, I don't have time. <laughs> How about I put a lock on the fridge and you'll have time, right? <laughs> you'll get time then. But it forced us to deal with all that stuff. And now everyone loves the laundry room. Like everyone like hangs out in the laundry room. It's like, there's an echo. I'm not kidding you. There's an echo in our laundry room. Is, am I, am I, is it true? It's true. There's an echo in our laundry room because there's so much stuff gone now. I, I go there. It's my prayer closet. I love it. <laughs> but I have to keep it real. I have to keep it real. There's more, there's more to the story. God helped me. God helped me deal with that crap. He did. He sent a little warning. You know what the warning was? A D80 dryer code. You ever get one of those in your dryer? Yeah, a D80 dryer code. That's a, that's a flow sensor warning. Yeah, you know what happened? The lint was building up in the tube, and I had to clean it out. Yeah, but not just that. That's the tube that goes between the dryer and the wall. Turns out there's more cleaning to do. I had to, yeah, see that? That's from, that goes up the, up the wall. That all came out of the wall thanks to this guy. Oh, yeah. I had all, the, I had like 35 feet of extensions. I'm getting, and all this stuff's coming out the wall. Lint. Oh, by the way, do you know that it's the fifth cause of house fires is lint? And I just have to think that God was giving me a little warning, a D80 warning, ping, 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 saying, you've got some buildup in your walls. You best deal with it or you're going to have fire. And I wonder if God's not speaking to somebody today saying, you know what? You've got some buildup in your wall, and you need to deal with it. Is God speaking that to someone today? Maybe you're watching online, and God's like, yeah, that, that's me. See, we often don't deal with, with stuff. We, we just kick, it, we kick the can down the road, thinking it's going to get better if, all by itself. Let me give you an example. Ch church hurt. If I asked you to raise your hand, which I won't, there would be a lot of people who say, yeah, I, I've got church hurt. I'm not really fully over. You know how I know? Not only do I hear it every Sunday, 
But I also know that people are watching online who will not come to church because they have been hurt by a church or by a pastor. And they're like, you know what? I can't go. I can watch online, but I can't go. And you know what you're doing? You're limiting. You're blocking, just like the lint blocks the blessing, right? The flow, your flow sensor is pinging and saying, God's saying, you're missing out on what I have for you. You know, I think, amen, I think, I think a lot of us, we go to church, but we don't serve because you know what? The last time I served, it didn't work out, and so I just, I was going to put my toe in the water but not really serve. You're missing out. Or here's a big one. Oh, you don't want to, people get funny when you talk about money. How about tithing? Tithing. Malachi 3.10. Now, either that's true or it's not. Either God lied or he didn't. And if it, I believe it's true, I believe the whole Bible is true. I mean, that's just how I believe. And, and, and Malachi 3.10 says that we bring our tithes in the storehouse, and he says, test me. Test me and see if I don't open up the floodgates. But you're like, nope, no, church hurt me, and I, I just don't trust him. I don't know if I trust Pastor John. Blah, blah. Well, number one, you're not, you ain't giving to me. You're giving to God. Amen. And number two, you're literally limiting the blessing that God wants to do in your life, intentionally blessing him because you say, you know, I got some crap that I just don't know. I got some buildup in the wall. I don't know. God's saying, once and for all, deal with it. Don't let a life lesson become a life sentence. I'm sorry you went through that hurt, but I'm not sorry because God used it to make you better, to make you stronger, to grow you into the man or woman that he's called you to be. Friends, I have my own story. And, and people say, you know, well, Pastor John, I love, I walk into the gathering and it just feels like family. It feels like, you know, friendly. I feel like people are real and, and, and you know, they love me. They actually care about me. You know why that is the way that is besides the clear work of the, the Spirit? Because remember, God allows us to control some of our trajectory. The part which we can control, the reason it's like that is because of what happened in another season of my life. I went through a painful church transition. Some of you know the story. And for eight months, I whined about it. For eight months, I was walked around, and I was the victim. And even my wife, she was like, little sweet Cindy, she's like, you need, you need to get over that. Remember? She did. She, she did. Ask her. She'll tell you. And, and, and what I needed to see is that I wasn't the victim. I was the student. And God was the teacher. And he was teaching me something. You are better for having that hurt. You are better for having that pain. You are better for having that train wreck that you had nothing to do with. Everything that happened to you, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't punishment. It was preparation for the growth that is going to occur from that and we'll use in this season. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's saying get over it and get on with it. Amen. Verse 26. Oh, it gets really good here. Do not... Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Make sure I got this straight. Help me out if I'm wrong. Suffer, then glory. Or was it, maybe, maybe it was glory, then suffer. Which one was it? Did suffer come first? Because I get so confused. I listen to everyone in the world, and all they want is to glorify themselves, and they skip the suffering part. In fact, I hear churches preach a prosperity gospel that, that somehow excludes the suffering. Friends, you can't have the crown without the cross. Any biblical message devoid of the cross is not a biblical message after all. It takes suffering to enter glory. Anybody have braces? Anybody have braces? You got those nice straight teeth. I can see it from here. Bing! You know about suffering. The gap is closed through suffering. If you don't believe me, just ask my daughter Stella. She just got hers tightened this week, and she couldn't eat for 24 hours because of the pain. Anybody have a bionator? A bionator? You don't know what a bionator is? That's because you got such good teeth. Nick, don't worry about it, man. Sorry, we're teeth, we, can't, we can't live up to the expectation of your, of your mouth. I'm just kidding. No. Bionators is things that help with the, um, the over, overbite, right? Or, or, or how about one of these? How about one of these? That's, remember those things? But what does that do? It hurts, but it leads to something beautiful. That kid is going to have a beautiful smile. And the truth is he already does. 
but it comes through pain. It comes through suffering. Some of you today, you're in a gap. You're watching online, you're at home, and you didn't even come to church because you just, you, you don't even know if this God we're talking about is real. God sees you. God sees you sitting in your room. God sees you driving your car. God sees you and knows you and knows everything about you. It feels dark, though. Sometimes God allows darkness to teach us something. Wait, 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 wait. Hold, hold on, Pastor John. That's bad theology. 1 John 1, 5. God is light and in him is no darkness. That's how you say it if you're a real Christian. No darkness. That's real judgmental. No, no. Tattoos, no. See, I slid that in there. Well, here's the thing. God is not, that's talking about his character, his absolute attributes. God is light and in him is no darkness. Praise God because he's good all the time. But he uses for the betterment and the developmental process of his people that he loves and he came to redeem. He will use a tool known as darkness to help us see what was already there. What do I mean? What do I mean? What do I mean? Friday happened. Cleopas and his wife. Oh, God. What, what, what happened? Question. Did, did, did the plan of God change? Because of, of the crucifixion? Did God go, oh, no. Oh, Gabriel, what am I going to do? No. Uh-uh. That was always the plan of God. But Cleopas and his wife, they just couldn't see it. So God allows darkness, the gap of darkness to occur to help us see what's already there. I need some help. Come here. I'm going to illustrate this. Come on up here. All right. So this is, this is Jay Panch. I'm going to, so this, this, I know it's a weird name, but that's his name. It's really, it really is his name. So um, God goes to his tool shed and he says, what, what, what tool do I want to use? Okay. You know, I'm going to get the blanket of darkness. Now, this is God we're talking about, all right? He says, I'm going to throw this blanket of darkness. Come on under here, all right? And this is what he does. I'm going to, under here, yeah. All right. Bro, you need like a breath, man. You have some onions or something? <laughs> Jeez. You got a Tic Tac or something? No, I'm just playing. All right, so he, he throws the blanket of darkness over. And uh, yeah, I know this, this makes me look great. You know what? All right. I know how many, like seven chins you're looking at right now. So here's what happens. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me think. Uh, Acts 9. The, uh, Paul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, right? Because he didn't believe, he couldn't see that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And so what did God do? He blinded him for three days, darkness, and what happens? He receives spiritual Sight. He helped, he helped him see what was already there. You want another one? Acts 27. 276 people aboard a ship to, to, uh, to Rome from Jerusalem. And what happened? Two, two, two people aboard that ship. One was uh, Paul. The other one was Acts, the author uh, of, of um, I'm sorry, Luke, the author of Acts, rather. And what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Darkness happened. A storm happened. God sent a storm for 14 days the Bible says they could not see the sun, S-U-N. God removed the S-U-N for 14 days through the gap of darkness so that they could see the S-O-N, sun. You follow me? What's going on? God uses, sorry about that, buddy. Order me a Big Mac when you're done. Thanks, Jordan. You, you follow what I'm saying? Like God uses this, this, this gap of darkness to help us see what was already there. Here, here, let me give you one more. This one, the gathering church, four years ago. Everyone thinks it's all hunky-dory, great and fun. Fred, you planted a church. You know how easy it is, right? And, and, and you also know that within those seven years, you experienced some darkness, some tough days, didn't you? Karen, you know what I'm talking about. There were some days. And, and, and let me tell you, let me let you in on the inside. I thought God, I thought God, Jehovah Jireh was magically in a, a building, like year one. Remember? Some of you guys have been, been with, with us since year one. And, and, 
And what happened? We tried to buy the CFTN building and God <laughs> shut that down. That was four acres, 300 seats. Could you imagine if we had 300 seats? We'd be doing like seven services, you know? Crazy. But God knew, but I couldn't see. So fast forward to year two. Year two, we buy 12 acres out on Olive and Reams, 12 acres. But then, unbeknownst to us, there's the, there's the easement and they can't build. And God shut it down. But God used that 12 acres along with the other property next door that we bought. We then sold that for $10 million. Thank you very much, Jesus. And are going to be able to pay for our new a location, our new land free and clear, cash, right? And, and by the way, that's going to be 20 acres if all the deal, and we're supposed to sign Tuesday. And if we sign Tuesday, I'm going to announce next Sunday where that land, where our home will be. And I'm very excited to do that. Trust me. So pray for that. <laughs> but here's what I'm trying to say is that that land where we're going to be, that 20 acres, it's been there the whole time. I've driven by that land so many times, but I couldn't see what was already there. And so God had used a little darkness, a, a couple of failed attempts, and God said, just trust me, I'm in control. Friends, the plan for the gathering never changed. The plan for Resurrection Sunday and the Messiah and our redemption, it didn't change. The plan for your life, it didn't change. We just need to see what's already there. What's God asking you to see in your life that's already there? What is it? What is it for you? What is it for you? Maybe it's a relationship that's redeemable. Maybe it's a, a person that's forgivable. Maybe it's a, uh, yourself that's, through Christ, lovable. Or maybe it's a calling on your life that through the resurrected king is now attainable. God is asking us to see what's already there so that we can get over it and get on with it. Amen? In verse, oh, sorry, verse 30, I want you to watch how the gap closed. Check this out. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then, and only then, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Amen. What they could not recognize on the seven-mile trek, when he's right next to him, they could somehow recognize across the table. What's God trying to tell us from that? I'm glad you asked. Here's the truth. Growth happens in gatherings. Growth happens in gatherings. There's power in numbers, and I believe we'll see that as this nation rises up and we fight, not for a particular branch, of, uh, but we, we fight for the things that Jesus fought for, our voice is going to be heard uh, c come Tuesday, right? Because we're fight. Because before I'm anything else, I am first and foremost son of God. I am a child of God. And there is power in numbers. There's power when we gather, when we come together and keep the main thing, the main thing, great things happen. You want to you wanna grow? You want to grow? You want to grow? You want to grow? You want to grow? Anybody want to grow? Quavium, you want to grow? Yeah? Quavium sitting next to Travium. No joke, you can't make that stuff up. <laughs> you want to grow? Okay, you know what you need to do? Get out of your row. You're sitting in a row today, and that's awesome, but the Bible says come to church. Don't forsake the gathering. But the best growth occurs around a table. It occurs in a circle. You want to grow, get out of your row, get in a circle, and experience true biblical community. Because if you aren't experiencing that, you are missing out on the very plan that God has for your life. And it's not just what you learn from somebody else. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a two-way street. We always think about, well, should I sign up for a group? Well, what, what am I going to get out of it? Stop asking that question. And start saying, God, what do you want me to contribute to this group? It's a two-way street. 
See, what, what, what does 1 Corinthians say? Or 2 Corinthians 1, four? He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can sit on our butts and watch the game. Nope. He comforts us so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. It ain't about you. It's about what God wants to do in you, but also through you. And don't leave that part out. Here's your assignment this week. You ready? You ready? Someone needs to hear God through you. Someone needs to, Pastor Rod, someone needs to hear God through you. And I know you go down to the homeless every, and, and, you, and you're preaching the word of God to people. Someone needs to hear God through you, Troy. I know where you work. He works at the wigwam. People need Jesus at the wigwam, right? Wherever you go, whatever you're, you're representing, you're an ambassador for Christ. But also, particularly to the family of God. Are you in fellowship with your family, speaking truth to someone who needs this truth spoken over them? Man, we need each other. We need each other. Revelation comes to relationship. Check this out. Verse 33. This wasn't in our text, but they, meaning Cleopas and his wife, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Woohoo! So wait a second, Pastor John. I guess they didn't need Cleopas and his wife. I guess you were wrong. Really? If they are so full of faith and he has risen, he has risen indeed, he has risen. He has, I think that's where it started, that whole thing. It's a church thing. If you've been to church the first time, you're like, what is he talking about? If you've been to church more than once, you know what I'm talking about. It's an annoying phrase we Christians say. It's a great thing, but it's annoying. Sorry, I know. Um, so if they're so full of faith, why? Why? was the door locked. What do you mean? I mean, John chapter 20, verse 19, it says the door that they were meeting in, that upper room, they locked the door for fear of the Jewish leaders. Do you see what, see what I'm talking about? They had enough faith to unlock their doubt and declare, woohoo, he's alive. But not enough faith to unlock the door. Could it be, could it be in God's unique and sovereign plan, could it be that the impetus, the, the driving force that would free the 11 apostles, that would free them to open that door and go out, which they did, could it be what happened next? Right here, they show up. Cleopas and his wife show up. The two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I think that was the gift in the gap. The gift to get those 11 and those others who were gathered through that gap season and enough boldness to not only declare that he is risen, but to walk out and live a he is risen life. You might be that person for someone this week. When you speak truth, you speak love over them, you might free them from a gap season. That's how powerful your words can be. Pastor, um, not Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, Mike P, although he's got a pastor's heart, he does. Mike P, some of you know him. He goes to this church. He sent me a text. That's what he sent me. True leaders help others see who God created them to be. And then he sent me a nice note, and then he told me that he was the better looking of the two lions. <laughs> Which, if you know Mike P, you know that is not the case. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, Mike. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, um, but he sent that to me because there was a time where he hit a rough spot in his marriage. And if you've been married for more than a year, you're going to hit a rough spot, right? It's life. And he, and he hit a rough spot and he called me and, and I, I, I didn't do anything special. I just was there for him. I veiled myself and God did what God can only do. And so he sent that to me 
thinking I'm the lion. Well, I'm looking at this, that picture, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I see you, Mike. I see you as the lion. What do I mean? Well, Mike would go on to, to, to lead a marriage group. His marriage group is packed. You can't get in it if you wanted to until they rotate. It, it's just, it's awesome because he leads from authenticity. He leads from his personal stories. He points to Jesus, but he doesn't hide behind the characters of the Bible. He's real about what God did in his life. And so I sent someone, we'll call him, he goes to this church and I'm not gonna use his name, but we'll call him Tim. I sent Tim to him a while back and Tim had just experienced a marriage gap. His, his wife um, is not sure she wants to be married anymore and so he's going through a tough time. And I sent him over there and he went to the, uh, Mike's small group and check out what he texted me. He said, thanks for your support. Mike has been like a big bro. He reminds me of my friends from the East Coast, a rough rider. The group is amazing, such wisdom. 41 years, and I'm finally at peace. I finally got to know the Lord. Whew. You know. You know. That's why you're crying. Because you know what community you know what a church can do. You've said it from this stage, and this church saved your marriage. Well, the truth is, Jesus saved your marriage, but he used this church to do it, and that's why you're crying. Friends, 41 years, 41 years in bondage. And yet, even in the midst of his gap, because right now, his wife still doesn't know if she wants to be married. So that, that gap isn't gone. God didn't just fix everything. In the midst of that gap, he found freedom peace that Isaiah talks about. Isaiah 26, a perfect peace, a peace that the world can't touch, a world can't take from you, it can't steal from you, it can't sucker punch you, it can't. It's peace that only comes by keeping your eyes on Jesus and realizing that if all hell is breaking loose around you, it's still going to be okay because we know how the story ends. Amen? That's, that's biblical community. Yeah, we can praise God for that because how did he do it? How did he do it for your marriage? How did he do it for Tim's marriage and all the He does it through biblical community. Friends, if you are missing out on that, don't. You will never experience the growth that I want you to experience if you don't live in biblical community. What I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity to sign up right now. Put that QR code. We have groups. We have groups that are starting in January. We have some groups that are going on right now. You can join up with a group. And maybe God's calling you to lead a group. You know what? Don't run from that. Don't be like Pastor Michael talked about last week with Jonah. Don't run from it. Don't run from that call. If God's calling you to lead a group, step up and you lead a group. If God's calling you to attend a group, you step up and a group. And, and by the way, don't pray about it. Don't pray about, is God calling me to it? He already said in his word. You don't need to pray about that. Don't waste God's time or yours. Oh, he's telling me not to pray. About that, no. Now, maybe you, what group do you want to be a part of? Should I lead that? Is that what you're telling me? There's things to pray about, but you should never have to wonder, am I supposed to be a part of it? Yes, he answered that one for us already. That box was already checked. Don't miss out on what God has for you. Friends, let's deal with our crap. Let's deal with it. Whatever it is, that gap has purpose to help us deal with our crap. Deal with it, you and me. And then... Let's learn to see what's already there. Let's, in your life, look around and see what's already there. What is, what's there? There's provision from your God. There's power through the Holy Spirit to overcome. And there's purpose. There's a plan that God has for you in that gap. And lastly, get out of your row. Get out of your row and grow. Get in biblical community. And in doing those things, huh, the gap may not end but you will get over it and you will get on with it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your presence in here today. God, thank you for what you're teaching us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness. If you don't know Jesus, you can know Jesus simply by asking him into your heart, whether you're watching online or you're here today. If you want to know Jesus, just say a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I make you my God from this moment forward. 
use me to do something great in this life. And thank you, Lord God, for not giving up on me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome them into the family of God. Welcome, welcome, welcome into the family of God. All right. And remember, if you, if you made that decision, we have a free gift for you. Stop at our little connect counter. Also, we have, we'll have our prayer partners up here. We'd love to pray with you. But remember, you guys have an assignment. You need to go tell someone something that they need to hear about God that comes through you. Go help them get over it and get on with it. Amen? God bless you guys. Have a great week.